Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Cheech. I'm Daryl Williams, and I am the Dean of the College of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences, the biggest and best college at the University of California, Riverside. It is an incredible honor and pleasure to welcome you on behalf of all of the College of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences, or CHAZ, here to the Cheech. This is our first partnership. Yeah. I am really, really thankful and delighted that we've had the opportunity not just to be here in the city of Riverside, downtown, in the Cheech, but also that we're able to bring our tremendous scholars uh, and share some of their scholarship and some of their work and their lives with the Riverside community, the Cheech community, and particularly, of course, all of us who are so committed to advancing educational attainment and world-class research around Latinx and Chicanx history and culture. So, so you might say, why are we here? I think most of you know why we are here. Uh, but we're certainly here to celebrate uh, Dr. Ricky Rodriguez's book, the publication of his book. a fantastic book. That book is called The Kiss Across the Ocean, Transatlantic Intimacies of British Post-Punk and U.S. Latina. <laughs> we'll be hearing a little bit more about that in a bit, but I think there's some copies available as well for purchase. And also the memoir, Some Kind of New Kick by the famed Chicken X. Yeah. <laughs> So, I, of course, I do need to thank someone. That's a couple different people, of course, the Cheech. Uh, not just Cheech Marin, but everyone here at the Cheech Marin Center for Ch uh, Chicano History and Culture, the staff here at the Cheech, especially Maria Esther Fernandez. Is Maria here? Not here? Oh, well, we thank her. Um, we also thank Concepcion Rivera and the Thomas Rivera Endowment, uh, the long standing investment that they have made in uh, writing and writers and creative life and uh, Latino Studies and Chicano Studies at UCR. The staff of the Dean's Office of Chaz is awesome. And I want to thank Jeff Perot, who's somewhere here, and uh, Julie Salgado and Melia Ramiro, who will be not just who's made this, uh, in, in this event possible, but also will be making sure that we uh, publicize it out on social media. So for those of you who are on social media, please do not forget not just to thank them, but also to tag Chaz, hashtag Chaz, uh, among other um, things. And we also have a step and repeat around, so you know, take some fancy photos as well. <laughs> thank <laughs> Professor Michael Jaime, uh, Michael Jaime Becerra of the Creative Writing Department, who will be hosting the conversation. <laughs> of course, Professor Alex Espinosa. <laughs> Ricky Rodriguez, Dr. Rodriguez, Kate Conway Powers. <laughs> and you're not here to hear from me, you're here to hear from them. So I'm going to turn things over to Professor, uh, to Professor Espinosa, or Tomas Rivera, the Dow Chair in Creative Writing, who's going to take it from here. So thank you for coming up. Alex! Yay. Thank you. I gotta say, I gotta say as, a, as a UCR alum, Chaz is the best college. I'm sorry. Arts and, Chaz College of Arts and Humanities rocks. Um, welcome. Uh, I'm Alex Espinoza, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Creative Writing in the Tomas, and the Tomas Rivera Endowed Chair uh, at UC Riverside. And it gives me great pleasure uh, to be here welcoming uh, each of you uh, to what is sure to be a fantastic event featuring two of our community's most groundbreaking creative and scholarly individuals, both of whom have contributed profoundly to the worlds of art, literature, academia, and music. We at UCR and in the greater Riverside community would like to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air the Kawiya, the Tongva, the Luiseño, and the Serrano peoples, and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. 
Today, this region is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, including UCR faculty, students, staff, and residents of the greater Riverside community. And we're grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. Um, this event would not be possible without the hard work and support from Dean Daryl Williams. So thank you so much, Dean Williams and the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences at UC Riverside. And I also have to give a shout out to Julie Salgado, to Jeff Gerard. I know she's not here, but Melanie Ramiro, who did all of the advertising and the social media work to get the word out about this event. Uh, and to Marcelina Rose Renell, and to everyone here at the Cheech, particularly Maria Esther Fernandez, who I, you mentioned cannot be here. She's in Berkeley working on an installation for Amalia Nessa Baines. Um, and she's really sorry she can't be here. Uh, to Mariana Careon, where's Mariana? Mariana, hey, thank you so much, Mariana. And Annie Guadarrama, where's Annie? All right, Annie's got the books, right? Annie ordered the books, so there's books. <laughs> so y'all better buy books. Christmas passed, but books make good gifts for next Christmas, right? So uh, we hope that this is the first of many more collaborative events between both the Cheech and UC Riverside. And I have to give a special thanks and gratitude to Concha Rivera um, for her continued support and the, for the Tomas Rivera Endowment that's making all of this possible. Um, but I have to turn my attention a little bit and say that there's one person who single-handedly pulled all of this together. Uh, one person who is basically the entire reason why we're here, and that's my colleague and professor, uh, Michael Jaime, of the Department of Creative Writing at UC Riverside, my dear friend. <laughs> Michael did this thing where he's like, pulled me aside, he's like, we gotta do this, we gotta do this. I'm like, okay. So, I just listen to what Michael says, and my life is so much better. Um, Michael is the author of two critically acclaimed works of fiction, including his debut collection of short stories, Every Night is Ladies' Night, and the novel This Time Tomorrow. I've been lucky to know him for over 20 years, and I hope you'll allow me a couple of minutes to share a few anecdotes about us. When I transferred as an undergrad at UC, to UC Riverside back in 1998, my professor and now both of our colleagues, Susan Stray, gave me a story of Michael's to read. And she told me he's from El Monte. And that struck a specific chord to me because I too was from the San Gabriel Valley, just across the river in La Puente. Yeah. Right? So here finally was someone writing stories about a place and a people I had direct access to. A place I recognized, and that moment, for lack of a better word, was epiphanic. When I was accepted to UC Irvine's MFA program in writing years later, Michael, already a student there, was the first person to reach out to me, to welcome me into an academic environment that felt foreign and alien to my working class sensibilities. Finally, Michael joked to me, there's another Mexican around here. <laughs> we were few and far between. We talked about the duck farm off the 605, the El Monte Mall, the outdoor mall, the Miller's Outpost on Valley Boulevard, where we both shopped, unbeknownst to each other, and the violent driving in La Puente. We relied on each other, on our memories of the people and the places who made us, right, to break that unfamiliar terrain and claim it as our own. And that's precisely what happened, and that's precisely what we continue to do as scholars, as artists, as writers, as academics, and as thinkers. So even now, as colleagues, it seems that wherever Michael leads, I follow. <laughs> and that fact suits me just fine. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our wonderful panel of guests, Michael Jaime Becerra, Kate Congo Powers, and my dear, dear friend, Ooh. Professor Ricky Rodriguez of the Department of English.
kind of hit the brakes here. <laughs> Hey everybody. Um, I just want to echo all the thanks that have been said one more time. Thanks to um, Dean Williams, Alex Espinosa, and the Avivera Endowment, uh, everyone here at the Cheech, the Chaz staff, everyone with a blue shirt uh, or a blue badge, Julie especially, and Jeff as well. Like This is an amazing evening, and it wouldn't happen without all that collective effort. Um, okay. Now picture this. It's an overcast morning in the fall of 1989, and my mother is driving my sister and I to school. From the car's cassette deck, one of two songs is playing. Sex Dwarf by Soft Cell. <laughs> because our mother's disapproval of the song cracks us up. <laughs> or Dazzle by Susie and the Banshees. <laughs> I've talked to like seven people about Cruel World already. <laughs> <laughs> Dazzled by Susie and the Banshees because my mother finds its long orchestral introduction soothing. Because my mother's in the house tonight, we'll say that Susie's on the stereo. I'm in high school at the start of my junior year, and my sister's in the eighth grade. Her school is the first stop. My mother pulls to the curb, and as I step out, know that I am dressed to impress, Black leather jacket over a vintage paisley pajama top, in <laughs> black jeans tapered by hand, and bursting at the knees because I don't know how to sew, in <laughs> pointy monk strap Doc Martens. My sister is wearing her bootleg Depeche Mode 101 shirt, <laughs> a green plaid skirt even though she goes to public school, and brown monkey boots which I will covet and occasionally force onto my feet, even though they are two sizes too small. <laughs> One of my sister's classmates, another Chicano junior high kid, passes and appraises the scene. His face compresses with disdain, and with full force eye contact, he will mutter, Binche New Waivers. <laughs> and my sister and I will look, each other, look at each other and laugh. For 30 some years, this moment has stayed with me, and I mention it here because our two pre presenters, in their respective ways, have lived their lives as embodiments of that moment's truth. That one can be both Chicanet and a new waiver, though generationally I'm more partial to the term death rocker. <laughs> Tonight's presenters have always known that identities are not mutually exclusive, that one can simultaneously be Latinx, and K-Rock, and queer, and new romantic, and punk, and post-punk, and on and on and on. <laughs> Our first presenter tonight will be Ricky Rodriguez. Some of you may know him. Some of you may know him as a beloved English professor up the road at UCR, or as Dr. Ricky on the radio, the DJ who spins your favorite post-punk deep cuts every Thursday afternoon. But I am lucky to know him as the sort of friend and colleague whom you can text with obscure questions about Mark Allman's lyrics. <laughs> and not only will he answer, but he'll send you a picture of the exact page from the book that references the answer. <laughs> Thank you, Ricky, for that. And as you read his wonderful book, A Kiss Across the Ocean, which is for sale, we mentioned. <laughs> Uh, I encourage you to do so with two bookmarks. One to keep your page, and one to quickly uh, access the meticulously and brilliant notes to each chapter. You're gonna be flipping back and forth the whole time. You'll be building a book list on the side the whole time. I said like, reading the notes is like visiting Ricky's office, because all the books are there. <laughs> Our second presenter will be Brian Tristan, known professionally, known iconically, for the last four decades as Kid Congo Powers. He has been a founding member of the Gun Club, a bad seed alongside Nick Cage, and a guitar player in the Cramps, shaping each group's most defining periods, in my opinion. 
Now he is also the author of this magnificent and touching memoir, Some New Kind of Kick, also on sale tonight. As a devoted Cramps fan, for years I imagined Kid in, a mytholo in, like, in mythological terms. Who was this Mexican dude standing beside Lux and Ivy and looking even cooler and more mysterious than they did? And later on I found out he was from La Puente, <laughs> just on the other side of the bridge, the Valley Boulevard Bridge from El Monte, where I'm from? How was that even possible? <laughs> When I finally had the opportunity to see him in person, you know, just standing there behind a merch table in some Texas nightclub, I had to suppress the urge to hug him, como un querido tío that I hadn't seen for years. <laughs> in the time since then, I've been fortunate to see Kid play a number of times. In fact, my son's first show was at a performance at an LA record store by Kid and his current band, The Monkey Birds. That afternoon, on the sidewalk outside the shop, I watched my son wiggle back and forth in his stroller, and I understood that wisdom about the joyous, unstoppable power of music was being passed on. Thank you, kid, for that. I'd like tonight to be a version of that experience for all of us, a sharing of our collective wisdom, a celebration of these two illustrious figures and their books. <laughs> Okay, without further ado, we'll dive in. They're each going to read for a bit, and then I'll be asking a few questions, then you'll get to ask a few questions. Both books are available, and it's going to be a signing and a party afterward. Ricky, please get us started. Before I start, I just wanted to thank everyone who made this possible, and, um, and everyone who came tonight. It means a lot to me to look into the audience and see a lot of familiar faces, of friends, of people that I just met. Um, and uh, most of all, I, I want to thank Kit for, for coming to Riverside. You know, it's, I'm a little nervous, but I'm uh, three drinks in, so I think <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, ner the nerves have been calmed to someone. Um, so, so thank you so much for everything. Uh, this is uh, from the first chapter, uh, Red Over White. Um, many friends whose teenage years have been marked by some form of trauma, induced, for instance, by bullying, alienation, divorce, or poverty, have told me there's a particular album that helped them weather their distress. Mine is the cures that head on the door, which helped me cope with a combination of the above-mentioned hardships. Initially led to the band by three songs in particular, The Walk, The Love Cats, and Let's Go to Bed, all featured on the 1983 singles compilation Japanese Whispers, that I received as a Christmas gift. The head on the door purchased with lunch money banked for buying music in lieu of cafeteria food. <laughs> tapped into and assisted in making sense of the despair that preoccupied me at the time. It was also the cure, particularly the band's lead singer, Robert Smith, whom I credit to lead, uh, for leading me to Susie and the Banshees. Indeed, I was thrilled to spot Smith in the video for the Banshees cover version of the Beatles' Dear Prudence, I fortuitously caught one day after school on video one. The music video programming, the program airing weekdays at 5 p.m. on KHJ-TV, Channel 9, and hosted by L.A.-based British DJ Richard Blake. <laughs> Directed by Tim Pope and shot in Venice, Italy, the video showcased a band whose name I had stumbled upon in magazines and eventually read on t-shirts and stickers plastered on my peers' notebooks. Reggie in geometry, Javier in biology, but which I had not until then considered investigating. In a pre-internet era, investigating music often entailed blindly purchasing a record or a cassette based on the band's name alone, with the hope that the music, heretofore unheard on the radio or some other media platform, might personally reverberate after hitting the turntable or the tape deck. Alternatively, one's entryway into a band's musical oeuvre was made possible by a friend generously dubbing on a cassette the records they or their siblings owned or borrowed. In some instances, a second generation dub tape sufficed for securing one's fandom of an artist whose work wasn't exactly attainable, attainable due to difficulty in procuring based on lack of money or record store availability. Music Plus around the corner couldn't compete with the selection at with Tower Records in Faraway Auditorium. So as you know from now, I'm from Orange County and I grew up in San Diego. <laughs> 
And when, while my obsession with the cure began to wane after the head on the door, to be quite honest, 1987's Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me, with its much too jaunty for a single Why Can't I Be You left me cold. It did, however, get transferred onto Susie and the Banshees for my deep appreciation of Hyena, the American version of the LP which, on which Dear Prudence appears, and their back catalog into which I subsequently dived. Moreover, I was drawn to Suzy Sue herself, in no smart, small part due to her unapologetic display of unshaved armpits and icy disaffection <laughs> in the Dear Prudence video, a visual analogy of sorts to the directive, fuck off. <laughs> Furthermore, the range and exuberance of her singing voice, enlivening but sarcastic on slow dive, distressed and breathless on obsession, or frenzied yet bold on monitor, resonated as a force that was as aggressive as it was empowering. Susie, in short, appeared to me at the right place, at the right time. As if recounting my own personal history, Benjamin Harper, in his essay, Black Eyeliner, Eyeliner and Dark Dreams, writes, as a chubby, alienated gay teen, I was searching for someone, anyone, who could tell me being different was okay. When I saw Susie in her signature thick eyeliner, and hair teased as if she had just stuck her finger into an electrical outlet, <laughs> something clicked. This woman was a weirdo and completely unrepentant about it. I knew she was the one for me. <laughs> in a similar vein, feminist journalist and music historian Lucy O'Brien corroborates, to me then, an idealistic sixth form of innocent, timorous yet aching to enter the wild, strange, and androgynous world she and her coterie seemed to signify. Susie was the one who knew. A woman who had surely been to the edge, nay, was living on it, a study of which would somehow give us access. Although she was a lone woman among men, Susie, to me, symbolized a kind of sisterhood. And while drawn to the likes of the jam and the clash, she got a punk icon of Teresa Covarrubias, the lead singer of the East LA band The Brat, notes that, quote, immediately the most striking were the women, Polly Styron, Susie Sue, the Slits, these really wild women, to me, that was so encouraging to see this whole wave of new music coming out with all these women was just amazing. This was what first got me to thinking, hey, I can do that too. And it is precisely this rousing outsider connection to Susie, a bond shared by many women, queers, Latinas, Latinos, and Latinx queers, we are entranced, spellbound, that elucidates the post-punk transatlantic touch that guides this book. And so I'll just stop there, uh, but uh, there are lots more chapters and, um, you know, that try to tie in the historical context as well as the personal narrative that I leave throughout the book. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Ricky. And thank you, everyone, for being here. And thank you, everyone. UC Riverside who invited me, and I'm really honored to be here at the Cheat. Yeah. It's really, really something. <laughs> and um, I'm gonna read from my book, Some New Kind of Kick, which is a memoir. Um, but I do wanna kind of give a quick shout out to uh, say that in the audience is the, uh, this cover picture, these young people, Marcy Blaustein, the photographer, sitting right here. <laughs> person who did the illustrations in my book is sitting right there, and my husband, Brian Kelly. But since we're here, I guess we'll start in La Puente. Yay. So, this is called The Feminine Bridge. They say some people are born under a bad sign. I was born under a bad bridge. Well, not bad, just mixed up and wrong. A bridge that couldn't decide whether it was male or female. I grew up in La Puente, California, a largely Hispanic suburb east of Los Angeles. Whoever named the town must have flunked first grade Spanish. <laughs> Simply misheard what someone else said or maybe even didn't speak a word, because a bridge is always, without fail, male. But we were named La Puente. Ours was female. 
Was it bisexual? <laughs> Transsexual? And sexual? Gender fluid? And where was this bridge? There was no bridge that I knew of in La Puente, not even a river to cross. But that wasn't the only neighborhood misnomer causing me confusion as a child. A few blocks from my home was the city of industry, <laughs> and the next town along from La Puente. Only it didn't smell of oil and dust, but tomato ketchup and strawberry jam <laughs> that wafted out of the Kearns factory abutting the train tracks at the end of East Temple Avenue. An invisible, fragrant cloud hung over the entire area, inducing an olfactory schizophrenia in the local population. <laughs> On stra strawberry jam days, life was sweet without a care in the world. On tomato ketchup days, for some reason, people were crabbier. Perhaps it was made from a deadly nightshade. My sister Barbara worked down the road from Kearns at the Mattel toy factory. Now, there was my kind of industry. In my imagination, she worked on the production line in a Willy Wonka wonderland, <laughs> alongside green-haired troll dolls, tinkering away, making toys galore. In reality, the Mattel factory was your run-of-the-mill urban sweatshop. I hate my job, was a common refrain from my big sis when she got home from work, exhausted by the mundane daily drudgery. I happily ignored her reality check for my fantasy, because she would often bring home discarded seconds and broken or misshapen Hot Wheels cars, <laughs> so much the rage for little boys at the time. They were going to throw these in the garbage, she'd tell me. I worked too hard to see them trashed. I figured you might be able to play with them anyway. Given that the most of the muscle cars I was gifted usually had no more than three wheels <laughs> and were so banged up they had, no, they had doors or interiors missing, it was difficult to play with them in the way Mattel intended. I created my own entertainment. Those broken up vehicles just happened to be perfect for playing demolition derby. <laughs> I would smash them together and send them careening over the end of a table to some terrible demise. I think I was probably inspired by my love for the commercials I used to see on TV for the nearby Irwindale Speedway, where the supercharged, customized hot rods raced along the strip every weekend. The commercials were a riot of noise and a real turn on, motors revving, cars colliding, and the announcer screaming his lungs out on top of it all. Barb also used to bring me tons of warped pieces of plastic tracks with hairpin twists and turns, which afforded me hours of fun creating endless roads to nowhere, my favorite destination. <laughs> La Puente's road to nowhere arched north to a freeway overpass, the closest thing we had to a genderless bridge and landed right in the middle of Hell Town. At least, that's what my mother told me they used to call Baldwin Park wow. in the 50s. <laughs> because it was the place she went to partake in any sinful activity involving drugs, prostitutes, and guns. Thanks for the tip, Mom. <laughs> if you were lucky enough to crawl out of Hell Town on your hands and knees back to over, over the overpass, a meditative respite awaited you. Just two blocks from our family abode was a solemn-looking red brick building with a perfectly manicured lawn outside. You never saw anybody going in or out of its front doors. This was the Burroughs Corporation building, a nightmare-inducing Twilight Zone episode to some. The Burroughs Corporation was a zen garden to me radiating coldness and endless mystery while striking fear into the population at large. The public's mind focused on fear of the unknown. If visitors from other planets were already on Earth, I imagine they probably worked in that building. It was only in my adulthood 
I would put two and two together and realize the company was founded by the grandfather of my favorite author, William S. Burroughs. Is that five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I can go on. Yeah. I think that was, the, from both of you, the, the perfect way to get this going. I think the first thing I had in mind was to ask about origin stories. And the, the opening to, to the memoir kit, I think, is a perfect sort of start to all of that. Um, I'm hoping to hear from each of you just like the musical side of this now. Like, this sort of, we're setting the scene. Let's talk about some sort of the early artists, the early influences. Like, where, where do the roots begin for you? Maybe I'll start with Kid and then go to Ricky next. Well, um, for me, my roots began as at, uh, I was still in my crib, probably. Uh, I had two older sisters who were into rock and roll. I, was, I got the golden ticket. I was, the youngest boy in a Chicano family. <laughs> so, uh, I have two sisters who hated me because I got away with murder. Uh, uh, my older sister Barbara and, and my sister Ruth, they were very into rock and roll. And um, so, you know, I was born in 1959, so in the early 60s, they had all of the um, latest uh, 45s. And um, my sister liked the you know, novelty songs like. Uh, who wears short shorts, and, and, uh, and uh, she loved the Righteous Brothers, and um, and all the Blue Eyed Soul stuff, and, and um, so, you know, that stuff influenced me, and I could actually, I, I, I knew which records, because I could hear the song, and before I could even read, I knew by the color of the labels, you know, uh, I would know what record I would, you know, terrify my sister by grabbing them and waving them around <laughs> and, uh, and doing that. And um, so, you know, that, that, that's, that's, you know, stuff I heard, like hits of the day. Um, you know, and as I got a little older, I had cousins who were in bands, you know, they had garage bands and covered Santana and Chicago and different things like that. And, um, and they were very into the Jimi Hendrix experience and, um, and Black Sabbath. And so, you know, they turned me on to that when I was probably eight or nine years old. <laughs> and, and I remember, and then, and then on the other side, I had my sisters, my older sisters who were, and cousins who were teenagers by this time, they would go out to dances. And I remember distinctly them getting um, dressed and dancing around and putting on makeup and, and being very excited about going somewhere. And where they were going was going to a dance where a band called The Midnighters was playing. And I said, I used to think, like, I don't know what The Midnighters is, <laughs> but it's something that means excitement. Yeah. And, means, and I thought, well, that's what I want. I want to be around excitement. I want to be around whatever is making them so turned on and excited. It's th that's what I'm going to seek out. And, still happens today. <laughs> so I, I briefly mentioned this in the acknowledgments. There were three records I remember in the, in, in the household uh, that I grew up in, and it was uh, The Supreme's Greatest Hits, Aretha Franklin's Lady Soul, and Carole King's Tapestry. And I don't know how those three records managed to survive, you know, the move from my parents' small apartment in downtown Santa Ana to the house that they bought. Um, but I remember playing them. And the first record I remember buying um, or having someone buy for me was uh, the 45 of Captain and Sneels that will keep us together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and then I also inherited um, David Bowie's fame from one of my aunts. Um, and, you know, I remember you know, growing up and listening to um, KRLA oldies but goodies. My parents, would, my mom in particular, would get ready for work in the morning and she would always have KRLA on. And so oldies were you know, kind of a fundamental part of my growing up. And I was telling a kid earlier that my uncle Lou, actually on my dad's side of the family, I come from a family of musicians, and my uncle Lou used to uh, play with the Midnighters and, and was a member of, uh, or played with the premieres and um, played a number of shows at uh, the Almonte um, uh, Legion. Um, Ballroom, and uh, and he eventually became a country music uh, guitarist and lives in Nashville now. 
Uh, but uh, yeah, my dad tells stories about singing uh, with um, alongside Rosie and the Originals, and and so that was the music that I grew up listening to. Um, my grandfather loved grancheras, and I remember going over to my uh, grandparents' house, and the guys would get drunk and there would be, you know, Vicente Fernandez on you know eight track tape. Um, uh, but it wasn't until I, you know. As we talk about in the book, you know, it was like encountering Culture Club on the TV screen. It was kind of like, you know, the, the gateway drug. Uh, <laughs> I'm so hoping you were going to mention that, because that scene is remarkable. I just want you to stay there for a minute more, please. Yeah, yeah, so um, my parents were on again, off again. I'm glad my dad didn't come tonight. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, my mom would work on the weekends, and she would drop us off at my my Aunt Irene's house, and uh, one morning we got there, and uh, you know I'd heard Carmen Chameleon on the radio, but um, she had a video uh, program on on Saturday morning, and I was like, who the hell is that? And I was just transfixed by this, you know, glamorous figure that I would soon come to know as Boy George, and you know, and seeing him on the cover of, of, of Star Hits magazine, you know, was kind of the entryway into finding out about all these bands and and, and musicians and. Um, and that was really, you know, the, the love uh, that I soon came to have for music and eventually found out about Kid and, um, and the Cramps and the Gun Club and, yeah, and so that was just, you know, I mean, I, my whole, I feel, I'm 51 years old, but I remember being, you know, just uh, inspired by music very early on um, because of the musical background of my dad's side of the family, but, my mom also just loving music and, and also responding to the lyrics of all these songs. She'd be like, these women are so stupid. Why are they falling for me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like we've reached the point in the conversation where we have to acknowledge the importance of the Ramones. And kid, I want to hand that to you because you, you, were, you were the director of the West Coast Ramones fan club as a, as a younger person. I think that that, that deserves some acknowledgement. Well, the Ramones. <laughs> well, the Ramones came at a perfect time. You know, um, for me, I was uh, uh, kind of grieving a loss of a beloved cousin um, who was murdered. And, um, and I was very kind of down. Um, and then I started to hear, uh, you know, I was a very, very, already a big music fan, uh, like I told you, from the youngest of age. And, um, you know, uh, really, um, it was like Patti Smith and the Ramones, you know, really uh, saved me from that. You know, they really brought me uh, out of that and kind of, Ramones, but I will say that you know, specifically with the Ramones especially because they kind of, not only kind of saved me, they blew me up, <laughs> you know, and they, they shocked me out of a, a some kind of doldrums, and, and 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 I just thought they were the greatest, like um, the greatest, uh, st smartest, stupid band, <laughs> you know. I thought it was a genius, you know, piece of art. Um, and you mentioned Music Plus, you know. I, I also. Uh, the day the Ramones uh, album came out, I went and waited in line at Music Plus the day I knew they were getting in the copy. And this is like, probably in El Monte, actually. Yeah. 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 The Monte Valley Boulevard, yeah. Five Points exactly. Plaza. Exactly. Yeah. 11 yeah. 40. Yeah. <laughs> Valley Boulevard. Yeah. And I thought for sure there was going to be big crowds and it was going to be sold out. And of course, I was the only person. <laughs> I got one of the three copies that I had ordered in anticipation of that. But, um, but also, the, but the, the, fan, the fanzine I started it was, you know, kind of born out of uh, people like Marcy and, and many people who were following the Ramones around, you know, and I just started to notice that there was this certain little handful of people that were at all the shows. They played the Ramones by every nook and cranny small club, every suburb, you know, that was going on, and um, and we followed them around, it was the same people, same people, and uh, we started to know each other, and send postcards, or, you know, call on the landline, you know, <laughs> uh, and, and so I thought, 
oh, I'm going to, you know, in some, for some weird reason, I thought, oh, everyone needs to know about the Ramones and what's going on. Because <laughs> we're already trying to do that. And maybe if I put out a, a stable together fanzine and, and, uh, and told people what was going on, it would, you know, be good for the community. <laughs> and actually, and the, the community of five people. <laughs> And, but, you know, but actually that community has endured it yeah. a lot. But people from that, that, that fan club are still friends of mine today. So it's worth getting the self address down the envelopes. I think we've arrived at the moment in the conversation now where we're this, it's the moment of, of transcendence. You really go from being a fan, you know, being a consumer, you know, purchasing the music to becoming active in music, or in your case, becoming active in study and, and, and pursuing that. And I really would like to both of you to speak to that process, you know, how do you transcend from making making that leap? Uh, maybe Ricky first and then, and then back to Kit. I'll just say that, uh, you know, since I was already waxing personal, you know, I remember um, my dad leaving and my mom was totally fine with me staying home <laughs> from school. And I would sit and listen to my records, and, and that was kind of what saved me from going to school. And um, and it was a teacher who yelled at me that he, you know, he said, to me, "You're smarter than this. You don't, you know, I don't know why." And he yelled at me in front of the whole class, and it was embarrassing. And that was kind of like what kind of snapped me back into getting back to my work. But but it was also the music that connected me to reading books, and 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 I, you know, just kind of lost myself in, in, in books and in novels in particular and you know I thought okay I can you know finally I have there's finally something that I that I like you know about school when it was reading and I had a few teachers who were really good um, in terms of supporting me but it was it was that passion for books that stemmed from the music and it was reading about the musicians that I was listening to who were reading you know, stuff by Jean Cocteau or Oscar Wilde or, you know, things that I would go and look for at the library. And, you know, and it just kind of got me on track and, and decided to major in English when I got to college. And, you know, all of the stuff that I've done is intimately connected to the music. And I think that's what was the impetus to write this book, to really think about the origins of, you know, my scholarly trajectory. And it's the music. It, it, it's the music that led me to books, that led me to films, to all of these other you know, forms of cultural expression um, that are so intimately intertwined. Yeah, was, you know, this is where we really intersect here. You know, that I learned so much about literature and films from reading interviews with uh, like Patti Smith or different, with different pop stars, David Bowie, definitely you know, uh, what they were reading and what they were looking at. And, uh, you know, that was going to be what I was going to look at and what I learned, you know, and I got a lot of my cultural education from that, you know, and just reading, I was, you know, magazine hound, you know, music magazine hound, and, and reading all of that. And, and everyone, the people, like this community I talk about, of, of, of music fans I started hanging out with, you know, they all were on the same page and all reading the same books and taking the same cues and we were all trading things with each other, yeah. you know, and this kind of, you know, went on and on. And um, so, um, so that, you know, uh, that education, you know, it was, it's a real education, you know, without having to step in a classroom. Yes. And, um, you know, it's a button. just go to a magazine rack. <laughs> I, I miss the magazine rack. I miss, you know, the, the magazine rack at Tower Records. You would have yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no money on a Friday night. Uh -huh. So you go to Tower Records and, like, look at the magazines. And the bottom row where all, like, the handmade stuff was, uh, was there on consignment. It was always the most interesting spot. Yeah. But, the, but, to, but to jump into, like, when it became something for me, to me, become a musician, you know, it was, you know, you know because of the Ramones, because of um, punk rock explosion in Los Angeles. Um, you know, uh, I mean, I didn't pick up a guitar until I was like, 20, 21. And, um, and that was because um, Jeffrey Lee Pierce of the Gun Club I had met, uh, and, and he just kind of point blank said, 
you should be in a band, and you're going to be in a band. You're going to be in a band with me. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> now, now I said, well, if, if, if I said, I don't play anything. And he's like, oh, I'll teach you. And, so, you know, and, and he's like, but you just need to be in this band with me. And I was like, well, if this guy believes in me, then, then I guess I owe it to try myself to try and, you know, and, 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 you know, I was thinking that I would be a journalist or a music critic, and I thought, well, I have to better put my money where my mouth is. <laughs> you know, if I'm going to want to criticize music, maybe I should learn how to make music, you know. Um, and so, but it was just a belief, and it was the times of, you know, um, music proficiency wasn't exactly the, the, um, the way, uh, you know, the way to get in a band, it was, if you, idea was king, you know, if you had good ideas, you should have a band. Yeah. <laughs> that was and, and we thought we knew better than anyone ever do that. <laughs> I mean, that, I mean, both of you write in your respective books really wonderfully about the way that community starts, starts to take hold in the way that we're, we're, we're talking about right now. Um, there's also sort of like informal mentors, peers, but also mentors, people that are sort of just one step ahead of you in whatever scene that you're involved in. Both books touch upon figures like this in your lives, and I just hope that you can speak for a few minutes about each of those. Um, maybe Kit first, and then back to Ricky after. Okay, well, several, several that's a, there's a, you know, that is really a, a lot. I think everyone was a mentor to me, you know, um, and, um, and, you know, I was gonna say, uh, to kind of circle back when you were talking about your family being musical, it was the same for me. And my, you know, my grandmother lived in Boyle Heights, and she was the matriarch of the family, and everyone would gather there. And there was a lot of guitar playing, a lot of drinking, uh, a lot of music, a lot of singing, a lot of uh, food. And uh, but you know, so that was music I knew to be a joyous occasion and to be a, a way to let loose. And then, um, you know, I had a, a, a neighbor of mine in La Puente who was uh, a few years older than me, who uh, for some reason took me under his wing and introduced me to like Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention and, and you know, our crumb free uh, comics and all things underground art, you know. And so this was a big influence on me, you know. and. and and then, um, you know, and then later it was, you know, there were definitely teachers in school. In, in my English class, you know, I had an English teacher, Mrs. Jenkins at Bassett High. And, um, and she was really said like, oh, you can write, and you should really, you know, do this. And I used to write the uh, music reviews for my high school paper, <laughs> The Olympian. <laughs> when I was trying to introduce, uh, you know, Suburban kids and not going to spreading the word to the New York Dolls. <laughs> <laughs> but these were people, yeah, who were, you know, I, I cite as, you know, there are just certain moments people really just say, I'm just thinking like, you can, well, they, just, they just say, you can do this, you know, and, and that is the encouragement that you need, as opposed to the person when I was in grade school, who uh, the chorus teacher who told me I couldn't sing. <laughs> and I didn't try again until many years later. Well, I still can't sing, but <laughs> I don't let it stop. <laughs> well, I think similar to Kit, you know, I mean, it's the people who, you know, I was following the musicians that I was listening to that were, in, that were mentors of sorts, but in the piece that I just read, you know, I was mentioning, you know, Reggie and Javier, and these were the kids who I went to school with who were a few years older than me, and, you know, they, they just kind of set, paved the way for me, and I admired them uh, because of, you know, how they looked, the music that they listened to. I feel like they kind of showed me the way, and um, I did a reading uh, a few months back in Santa Ana uh, uh, that my friend Sarah organized at the Libre Mobile, and some friends of mine from high school came including Javier, who was like the most elegant goth kid you could imagine, or death rock at the time. And he would come to school with eyeliner and 
hair over his eyes. Uh, and he was telling the story about how, you know, he and his friends would go to um, Buffums and buy these funeral dresses with big shoulder pads and, and, and had them up and wear them to school. And, and then they would take them off before they got home because their father or their dad was going to beat them up. Um, but, but these were the kids that I really looked up to. And, and, and when I told Javier that, you know, I was like, you were, you were my mentor. You know, I just really looked up to you and admired you. And you know, we both just had a crying moment. But, but it was also, it, 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 it's the peer, your peers who kind of, who serve as those informal mentors who kind of show you the way and show you that there's a, a different way to be in the world, uh, which I think is so important. Yeah, that, that idea of possibility, right? That there's a deeper possibility. I think both books touch upon that as well. Um, I really, kid, I'm thinking about the passages in the book where you're writing about the way that Ivy's, Ivy from the Crown, Poison Ivy from the Cramps is showing you guitar chords, mm -hmm. right? And that sense of faith, that sense of confidence, the sense of identity, right? Before that, you're Brian. And then there's, you know, as legend goes, you know, there's a, there's a ceremony, and you know, your kid, your kid Congo powers, and I just, you know, the, the the presence of that. I think we all have our versions of that in our respective ways, and it's just the idea of the presence of that, the, the way that your life can sort of pivot just based on someone's faith in you. I think is really, you know, I'm glad that both books capture that so well. Um, I think the other thing that, 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 that the books both capture, I think, are the idea of sort of historical queer spaces that were sort of formally like formally thought of as queer spaces. And I thought we have to touch upon that. Um, maybe Kid first talking about, you know, the, the scene in Hollywood, um, the sort of acceptance that it was just sort of, you know, everyone was there and moving on to Ricky and what your experiences were as well. Well, um, well for me, you know, in the punk rock, uh, you, know, um, you know, I came out of the glam rock scene, you know, Rodney being in our years English, I was go. a teenager going there. And, experiences and <laughs> I read about it and, um, and, and um, but you know but that, that a lot of people came a lot of the around there there was a lot of um, queer posturing going on it was kind of like guys acting gay to get the girls uh, going on mostly the older people those old people probably 21 <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but there was a lot of, I met a lot of gay, high school age guys, and we were there to be near music, to be near the excitement of the scene, um, and, and, you know, women, women as well, you know, a lot of gay women, and, um, and we are, we were, like, Randy Kay, a friend of, of you, and, um, and uh, Dennis Crosby, different people um, uh, were uh, actual uh, queer kids who were excited about rock and roll. And for me to find these people were, it was amazing. And I, well, and actually, I didn't meet Randy till the punk rock, Randy Kay, who I said, I, but he recognized me from Rodney's. He said, Oh, you were the guy with the big platforms with the rhinestone lightning bolts on it, weren't you? <laughs> And I was like, yes. And I, said, I didn't know anyone had noticed. And, and, but you know, but this is a bonding, you know, a bonding thing. And 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 that, so that led into the punk rock uh, thing. But you know, at the time coming up then, you know, being gay, there was a political movement that would, uh, and a gay movement that would have been open to having young people. But you know, punk rock, we were rejecting. And you know the thing was the labels were taboo. You were you don't say you, you can't pin yourself down, you know. Um, and so uh, even the you know you wanted to stake up you know shake up the status quo, you know. And so for the gay kids in punk, you know, we wanted to shake up the status quo of the gay, you know, and separate ourselves out from that. We didn't identify with the clone or disco. Even though disco music is so great, um, but, uh, <laughs> but 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 you know we didn't identify with that, and we were you know off on a trip trying to forge our own identity, you know. And and I, I talked to a, I, I was talking to a friend Adele Berté who was in the band The Contortions, and she was like, she was like, she was saying talking about the book, and she was like, yeah, it was great how fluid it was, uh, no one questioned. 
this. And, and if anyone had uh, brought up identity politics, then we'd have wrapped them in duct tape and threw them in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but you know, it wasn't really for me until AIDS that it became, like I thought I need to politicize this or come out even, you know. Um, there was really no formal coming out. I mean, there was a lot of coming out and going back in the closet for me. <laughs> you know, it was like, what's going on? Yeah, I don't want to admit it, I'm gonna admit it. You know, a lot of, uh, it wasn't as much confusion as like fear of, of uh, you know, you know, it's scary being queer yeah. in, in public, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, but you know, with time, with time, <laughs> it became something to celebrate. But you know, but, but it was, it was very inclusive. There was all kinds of people in pop rock, you know, and that, you know, at the time, you know, women, women, transgender people, uh, queer people, black people, brown people, you know, it was, it was wide open in the beginning and very celebrated. All you had to do was buck the system. And that was your ticket in, you know. There was really no other requirements than that. <laughs> I'll just say that, I mean, the, all of the, the musicians and bands and artists that I write about in the book, I mean, it, for me, it's always been like, this music is queer, and if you embrace it, then you have to kind of re-alter your relationship to heterosexuality or, or straightness in, in a way, because the music in, in many ways just kind of altered, you know, those, those norms and those conventions. and. You know, really, for me, you know, the, the kids that I listen, the kids that I hung out with in high school who listened to this music, you know, were already alienated, whether you know it was you know because of their sexuality or their race or their class background. Um, and so, in many ways, the music, you know, kind of served as a vehicle through which you know we could you know kind of imagine ourselves queer without even having access to that word, that, that term at, at the time, right? And you know, and of course, we would get tormented. And, made fun of because we listen to this music. So it's kind of interesting now that there's this nostalgia for the 80s and people are like, oh yeah, I love that band. It's like, yeah, you didn't like them in high school. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but yeah, so I mean, for me, it was like, you know, to kind of enter into that realm to go to shows, to listen to these artists, you know, you were kind of embracing a queer ethos because it was a way to, you know, kind of block the system. It was a way to kind of challenge the norms that existed. I'm thinking. I'm thinking also in terms of, of race and the ways ways that race sort of plays out in each of the books in, in similar ways. Um, I, I want to ask this next question as a shout out to the Chicano kid that was at your stories event in Echo Park a couple months ago. Um, and to sort of set the scene, this is in the patio of a small bookstore in Echo Park. There's a high fence of, of wrought iron around the back patio, and this kid had like the space had filled. And this kid had climbed the dumpster, was hanging from the wrought iron, and they said they opened it up for questions and answers, and his was the first. <laughs> and the question he asked you, which was like, we're at this point in the conversation now, where he asked him, what was it like being Chicano in the middle of all that scene? And, um, and I remember your answer, and, and if you want to build off that, please do, but your answer was, the worst thing that I was called was Devo. <laughs> <laughs> Ricky, in your book, I know that I know that you go deeper into very specific examples from your own life and from and from you know in, in literature as well. But if we could sort of speak to those kinds of experiences, I think that, that we'd all appreciate hearing some of that. So, um, <laughs> I forgot about the Devo. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, he was asking specifically like you know being Chicano yeah. uh, in punk. He's like. You know, were you beat up, or were yeah. you were you harassed a lot by surfers, or, or yeah. whatever? You know, something like it was that. That was the question. I said well, that was actually not my experience. I mean, I understood racism and I understood homophobia. You know, and, and it existed in those in that world. You know, um, but not with the people I was with. You know, and. Um, little bit of safety in numbers sort of situation that the people I associated with were very open-minded people, you know, culture vultures and, and, and just open-minded people. I wouldn't hang out with someone who wasn't, but, you know, in the punk scene at large, I wasn't harassed or, you know, anything. I was, I was probably very quiet, 
yeah. you know, I was a sullen young man. <laughs> <laughs> but, really? Yeah, I'll just say, I mean, I grew up in a predominantly uh, Chicano um, community, um, and, you know, we just, I mean, it, it, the thing that always strikes me is that there's always the assumption that if you're part of a particular ethnicity or an ethnic group that everyone is you know, the same, you know, that you listen to yeah. the same music or you have the same experience or the same background, and that certainly wasn't the case because, you know, even growing up in a predominantly Chicano, you know, community, it's like, you know, everybody had their own, you know, unique um, claims to identity, you know, whether you listen to heavy metal music or punk or, um, or rap or hip hop, you know, there's, it was so so mixed, but um, but for me it was it was never something that I felt ashamed of. It was something that was just kind of you know who I was, and I didn't feel like it it was a barrier to explore um, you know things beyond what I was expected to gravitate towards. And I think I learned a lot from from my parents who you know were kind of you know who grew up experiencing racism, um, but then also just kind of refusing those. You know, a, you know, the ideas of what it meant to be Chicano. My, my grandparents grew up in Southern California during uh, racial segregation. My grandmother would talk about going to you know the movie theater, and the Mexican kids had to sit on the balcony, and the white kids would sit on the bottom floor. And you know, we knew these stories early on about racism, um, so there was that awareness of, of being racially and ethnically different. But it was never you know a hindrance or a problem. It was actually something I think that kind of supplemented you know, how we could express ourselves um, individually, or as individuals. Um, I have two more questions, so I want people in the audience to be thinking of theirs. Um, you're up next. Um, the, f the first is, is you know, uh, we've all been listening to this music for a long time, but we've also sort of been growing as people change, as people evolving as people, and I want to ask each of you, like, for some of these formative artists, you know, some of these formative music scenes, some specific songs, like how has your relationship relationship to that material changed over time? You know, from you know where we where you were as a younger person to where we are now. I don't like prog rock anymore. <laughs> <laughs> when I was very young, I thought it was the best thing. Um, <laughs> but that was it. Was my introduction? It was my. I thought this is weird music. That's all I knew it was, and then I thought, oh, this is great the way it has 800 million changes in the, <laughs> in the first 10 seconds. <laughs> but, um, so, yeah, I don't, a, I don't have a relationship to it. <laughs> I mean, that's the remotes changed that for me. Uh, one, two, three chords. Uh, but, um, I, I, I don't think, besides prog rock, I don't think I really lose any relationship to music, and music to me now is, is as important and um, nourishing to me, you know, it, it is my food, it's been my entire education, it's been uh, what gives me hope, you know, and, and uh, as a music making person, uh, I can't see stop making music, you know. <laughs> when, when are you gonna stop? <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, I feel like it's uh, such a, um, I still am in that kind of punk rock thing that I still feel like I have something to say in a different way or express in a different way. But, and you know, whether I use, you know, humor or, or um, noise or, or whatever, you know, whatever serious uh, spectral, uh, <laughs> a serious spectral uh, encounter. Um, you know, all of these things are worth celebrating. I mean, I, you know, I use a lot of people who've passed away uh, as song inspiration because usually someone I admire or knew who I thought was one of these special beings on earth passes away. I want to try and capture something about it that before the essence is lost, you know, and, and that's the kind of um, thing that keeps me going, you know, um, and, I, and plus, I don't know what else to do. <laughs> but, but I still love music the same, I still relate to it the same way, I still, you know, 
listen to Patti Smith and start crying and, you know, you know, over the music today, you know, I could still uh, feel that um, my relationship with it has changed. It's an ingrained emotional, um, an ingrained emotional response that has become uh, not just intellectual and not just emotional, but actually primal, you know, and, and, and so, um, yeah, music. You said, said, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I think uh, teaching classes um, about popular music has kind of, I, I think, bolstered my love of the music that I grew up listening to. And, you know, it's a younger generation who is discovering this music and, and, and really using it as a way to make sense of, of their realities, which I think is really empowering. I was just telling Kip uh, before we got started uh, that I have a 13-year-old niece, and you know she, she was just transfixed by Wednesday and you know the the, the Goo Goo Muck scene, and she just loves that song. And, and for her, you know that was you know kind of a, a form of empowerment, you know, uh, musically and then, you know, in terms of the image and you know being able to identify as an outsider and and and, and I think you know it. it, it People feel sometimes like they're kind of gatekeeping music, like, oh, this is music of my generation. And for me, it's like, you know, it's all about, you know, younger generations discovering the music and and embracing it and, and using it. And like these guys here, the Ghost Town uh, DJs, you know, I met them at a specials concert in Anaheim, and they had this really cool banner that said, you know, Anaheim against racism. And I was like, who are these kids? And I had to go talk to them. And, and I was just really struck by how you know they were, you know, drawn to this music uh, about you know '80s you know British two-tone music that was all about you know unemployment and you know economic despair and and making sense of it you know as as Mexican Mexican American kids in Southern California and, and I see my students doing that as well and and just kind of seeing them embrace that music just makes me love the music even more because they're translating it for a different historical context that I think is really empowering for, uh, for them and me. Um, Ricky, you're a DJ, kid, you spent your life in music. Everyone has Spotify or YouTube in their pocket right now. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you to sort of maybe, like, what's a song or a couple artists that you think people should be listening to on their way home tonight? <laughs> Nothing. I actually, you know, I, I'm a, uh, I actually like this really um, young uh, band from Boyle Heights called The Tracks, and they are beautiful. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> And they're like young Chicano kids. And the singer looks like Richie Valens. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but they're like Chicano rock and roll band uh, from Boyle Heights called The Tracks. And their records are great. And uh, the um, people, a lot of say, oh, I see the influence of The Cure in them a lot. But I see some, like a lot more in them. And, um, you know, I see Billy McKenzie from Associates. And, and they're drawing, you know, uh, upon uh, British rock and roll, you know, and, um, and, and there are these Chicago kids from the east, uh, east LA, and and they have some records out. They have some records. I love I love the way you're putting that too. Like you're seeing into the music, like you're seeing these other layers of it. You're seeing these nuances in it. Like that's that's why I'm asking this question because like, we have this expertise. It's brilliant. Thank you. Uh, that's really hard to answer, only because. I feel like sometimes I'm mired in, in the 70s and 80s, but, uh, you know, a, a few summers ago, I was telling Kip this, I took a group of stu UCR students to Scotland and, uh, and had a, you know, taught a class, two classes there, and uh, just learning about these up-and-coming bands at the time was, it was really great. You know, there's one group, and they have a band, uh, an album coming out uh, called Young Fathers, and they're kind of a combination of uh, trip-hop and, uh, uh, post punk, and they're really, really good, uh, and so I'm looking forward to the new album. Uh, so they're the ones that come to mind right now. Uh, yeah, there are others that I'll probably think about when this is over. <laughs> <laughs> you can mention it in the book signing line to people. <laughs> All right, uh, questions from the audience, please. A hand over here. Hi, do you think, uh, based on your experience in the past and your experience now, do you think it's harder to break into the music scene and actually make a living out of it? 
or is it easier? I mean, some of it just seems like a fire hose, which is so much out there. Oh, for me, um, same Dean said in Rebbe Vakas, who lives? Uh, lives off music. <laughs> um, but, well, I guess it's twofold, that, that, that whole thing that there is a lot of access to Bandcamp and, and a lot of access to recording at home these days, where, which would make it much easier to be very DIY about what you do. And, but there is, but there always has been such a glut of, of bands, you know, trying to make it. You know, the thing that I came out of punk rock and um, the idea wasn't to make it, you know, it was to express yourself and um, and that we made it, you know, whatever it is, uh, that have continued to make records. I'm, I'm just grateful I continue to make records and that people connect to them and, um, and um, a lousy businessman. Uh, but, but somehow it seems to continue on. Uh, but, it, but yeah, I think, it, I, I don't know. I think the days of getting signed by a big company is just gone, you know, or for me, it's way out of my sphere of, of what is possible. Um, and, and plus, I never had a desire for that. I had a desire to be well-known and to make money, but I didn't. But my desire to um, have that, uh, if, it, if it was there for a minute, it, it passed very quickly. Um, but I do, I do, uh, you know, I don't know. I'm so underground, I don't know. <laughs> um, Ken, I'm curious, you know, you worked with, Three people who changed the ions in the room in Lux and Jeffrey and Nick Cave. As a, a solo artist yourself now, have you taken something from each of them? I took their ions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that um, I've taken something from all of them. You know, uh, the one thing I feel very fortunate about is. I've been able to learn from the best up close, you know. Um, but that also, um, you know, finding my own identity, this is, that was the harder part, you know, because uh, when you have a pedigree like that, people expect certain, you, you to be a certain way. And, you know, when I started uh, being in a band where I was the singer, you know, Believe me, nobody wants to hear the guitar player sing. <laughs> I mean, people do not buy even Keith Richards so well. <laughs> you know, uh, people don't want to hear, you know, that's the last thing. So for me, you know, I, it took a, a, it was a long time of first finding my own voice because uh, there, there, there was a lot of me wanting to reject what had happened and we tried to be something different. Uh, I was actually very inspired by one of the last uh, shows I saw of the Cramps. I hadn't seen them for a hundred years, and, and I hadn't spoke to them. But we, uh, they invited me to a show they were doing, um, uh, probably one of the last couple tours they did, and 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 we, you know, and I just my, I saw them on stage, and my jaw dropped to the ground like the first time I saw them, and and I was like, oh, wait a minute, like it's just like. The same three chords, it's the same thing, I know all of this. Why does it sound like it's from heaven and Venus and outer space and it's like, you know, you know, making my jaw drop on the floor, then I, it just looks gone on me. It's because they're being themselves. You know, they're giving themselves. They are just being exactly who they are. And that was a real epiphany, so I was, you know, it was like, at the age of 40 something, I was like, no, oh, I guess I can be myself. <laughs> yeah, but, but no, it was a real a lesson, you know, that um, I didn't have to, I didn't have to reject who I who came before or try to divorce myself from it, that I could actually uh, take what had accumulated and try to harness that into what I do. Thank you.
question over there. Did you ask if there's a playlist? There is one. It's um, on, on that platform I shall not mention. Because uh, they don't pay you. Uh, but uh, there, there is, uh, if you, it's a little bit of a roundabout way, but there's a, 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 a British blog called Large Hearted Boy. And just look up Large Hearted Boy, Kid Congo Memoir playlist of it's there and uh, I'm actually been working on a super comprehensive one that's like about 900 hours long <laughs> <laughs> and I'm getting there <laughs> and I'll print it when I'm excellent I think on that note um, we're gonna we're gonna draw this part of it to a close um, book sales are over there I think the, uh, the, the, the signing line will be over there Thank you, kid. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.